Good morning. Welcome everyone to this worship service in August where uh, the evenings are a little bit cooler. We've had a couple of warmer days, but it's it's been nice, hasn't it? it it's been a hot July. This morning our call to worship comes from our God who calls us here to worship, whether we're worshiping online or via radio or here at church. God has gathered his people from all around the world together, particularly on Sunday mornings. We come together to worship, longing for tenderness, because this world can be hard. We come longing for light because our lives are crowded with shadows. We come desperately needing direction. We pray, Jesus, fill us this morning with your peace. Your spirit is our peace and our path. We worship the one, Jesus, who had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom people would hide their faces, he is despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Let's come to our God in prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for the love that you have extended to us, that you have come to walk beside us with tenderness, with grace, and with mercy. We thank you, Jesus, that your heart is such that you call us to know you better. You call us brother, sister, child. You call us your friend. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you loved us so much, that you had chosen to send your son Jesus who made himself nothing for our sakes. And as we continue in this worship time, having heard your word that our sins are forgiven as we confess them, we give you our hearts and our love. To you be the glory. Amen. We're very privileged this morning that Erla and... Um, Margaret are going to sing for us. It's an old, old song, and uh, I hope you will enjoy it. For those tears, I died.
Thank you so much, ladies. As you know, um, today, uh, in terms of offerings, today is the last day that we're able to respond to, um, well, not the last, last day. It's the last day we could respond to Beirut and have our monies matched um, through Presbyterian World Service and Development and the Canadian Food Grains Bank to help those in Beirut. Um, it, perhaps if you've been reading, 85% of their food stores were in that port. And so it is, uh, it, it's very vital that, that we respond and uh, very grateful for those of you who have already done so. There's been a lot of generosity in response to Beirut. Um, our offerings uh, can be given, continue to be given online or can be sent or as you leave today in the offering plate in the back and they will be collected later. We worship a God who is so gracious and kind. And I'm continuing to go through um, some of our travels uh, as we went to Israel and as we look at some of those pictures and begin our message, our scripture will be um, throughout the message, so I'm not going to start with it um, right now, um, but we'll, we'll be catching them as we go along. We'll just see if the PowerPoint is going to work. Wrong order, right, Tim? Sorry about that. <laughs> we'll use that song in response to the message. <clears throat> so, give, give me power on my clicker. That's all right. The first picture doesn't really matter. I'll just, I'll just continue while Tim sets that up. So a college professor uh, meets his new class, and there's going to be a lot of that going on in the next while. And I don't know if you've ever been to either a, a larger college. Oh, maybe I should actually start recording for our, am I? Yes. <laughs> Technology. He comes in front of his class, and the college professor asks, if any of you think you are unintelligent, stupid, not able to learn, then I invite you to please stand. And nobody stands up. He waits for a while and then he tries it again. If any of you students here feel like you're unable to learn or too stupid, then please stand up. He, he repeated this a few times throughout that first time. And, and then finally a student in the back stood up in the college professor said, do you consider yourself stupid? And the young man said, no, sir. I simply felt so bad that you were standing alone. <laughs> Empathy. Empathy is that moment when another human being comes alongside another because their heart is either rejoicing with them or empathizing with whatever they're going through. For joy or for sorrow, for heartache or for pain, somehow they lend their whole being to sympathize with the other. The psychologists actually during this time are noting that people are less empathetic. I suppose that makes sense, right? We're, we're not able to meet the way that we normally do, to share joys and sorrows. But it's been going on for a long time, if you think about it. We, we post our joys and sorrows on Facebook, on Twitter, on I don't know, whatever your platform or favorite media is, Instagram. And what happens is when you feel empathetic to another, you click a little button and you give them a little smiley bear face that says, I care. Or you send them balloons and say, woohoo, congratulations. 
and then you move on. Our empathy moves from flipping through a Facebook page that says there's been a terrible incident and then we feel sad about that and not even a half a second later we scroll again to, um, I don't know, maybe a America's Funniest Home Video and we're laughing our heads off. And psychologists say we are losing the art of empathy because we don't sit there and allow those emotions to grasp us the way that we used to. You know, our family's been reading through the book of Job. Talk about happy summer reading. But you know, Job's friends came and sat with him for three days on an ash heap. They felt his sorrow. They shared his sorrow. One thing we need to know is that the church should never lose the ability to empathize, whether that's for joy or sorrow. It's one of the gifts of being in community. And it's one of the things I'm going to say right now. It's great being live. It's great being on YouTube. But even though we aren't meeting together as we normally would, there needs to be a way that the church continues to reach out and empathize. And that takes effort. I know it takes effort for me, and I'm encouraging that effort for you. Romans 12 encourages us to weep with those who are we weeping and rejoice with those who rejoice. And empathy calls us to do both of those things as a community, no matter where we are. I wonder if I might just take you on a journey with um, Jesus' last day, the one who empathized in all our joys and sorrows. We're taking you to the night on which Jesus was betrayed. And um, for those of you who are watching um, on YouTube or perhaps you're in your, in your cars, uh, an email was sent out. If you don't get email, perhaps I'll drop off some pictures to you later on. But here's a map of Jerusalem, and at the far right side is the Garden of Gethsemane. It's up just kind of halfway up the Mount of Olives. And we follow this pathway down on the outer ring, and then towards the next big arrow is Caiaphas's house. Caiaphas was the high priest of the Jews at that time. And this is the journey that Jesus took after he was arrested. Now, archaeologists are, they say, 99% certain that this was Caiaphas's house. Why? Because it was in the Jewish quarters. It was a very rich-looking home and had many um, grain storages. So Jesus starts off walking from the Garden of Gethsemane, taken by the soldiers through the Kidron Valley or the old city of David, up these steps to Caiaphas's house. This is a palace that we're horrified to find out that, where did it go? This is where we'll read our scripture. On the evening that Jesus was betrayed, at his arrest in the evening, all his disciples deserted him and fled. And those who arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. Now I'm going to jump a couple of verses ahead to Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 and 2 where it says, early in the morning, all the chief priests and elders of the people made their plans to have Jesus executed, so they bound him and led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. I want to ask you a question a moment. From the evening that he was betrayed to early in the morning, where was Jesus? Now see, this became a very important question as the archaeologists discovered this home and also we're reading um, traditional stories. You see at Caiaphas's house when we enter those historical remains 
we see deep pits of grain storage which means a lot of people were housed in well i wouldn't necessarily say a house probably more like a palace um, like the rendering at the bottom of that picture and in that home as we also descended down many stairs we found some shocking things jail cells deep down below where those who would break rabbinical law were brought to Caiaphas the high priest they were judged they were tried and they were held in cells of deeper concern was one this is the top of the floor looking down into a pit that goes down 20 feet it's all lighted up for us tourists here but it was a very dark pit that descended down again the one picture of just stone walls is a very small holding cell in which people would be dropped down and left now tradition says this is where jesus spent the night before having been brought to pilate betrayed by judas abandoned by his followers denied by peter who was just outside in the courts one needs to wonder if jesus was spending the night there whether he who knew the psalm so well might have had psalm 88 run through his mind and i am going to read that entire psalm i invite you to either close your eyes and just hear the words wash over you i will have the words on the overhead or if you have your bible available you can open that up as well to psalm 88. lord you are the god who saves me day and night i cry out to you may my prayer come before you turn your ear to my cry I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who live in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavy on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken me from my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in the destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me your terrors have destroyed me all day long they surround me like a flood they have completely engulfed me you have taken from me my friend and neighbor darkness is my closest friend this may well be the experience of christ our lord on that night that he was betrayed when he was left in caiaphas house and no doubt in that pit for the evening amazing isn't it that jesus did all of this to empathize with us a people whom he loves whom he created whom he seeks to redeem he knows what you're going through now and he's been there and he empathizes he knows what you've been through perhaps long ago when you felt abandoned and alone. He was there. He was there when perhaps you didn't even know him. He walked with you 
and he felt your pain. Perhaps there were times, or are times, even now, when you want to celebrate because good things have happened. Jesus is there, and he rejoices over you. As Zephaniah says, with singing. It's true that Psalm 88 is by far the darkest psalm in Scripture. There is no, but I will yet praise the Lord at the end, like many of the psalms do. It simply leaves us with the reality that sometimes life is hard. And yet we know that our God and our Savior knew exactly what was happening, and he was there. You know, one of the things that I remember about my dad was he loved to throw a great party. So if there was a birthday or an anniversary, it didn't always have to be like the 50 or the 40. It could have been the 42. If he could have a reason to have a gathering of people, my dad would do that. He loved to share his joy with other people. And it's so wonderful that as a church community, we do that so often and so well. And it's true that as we gather for other reasons, for other sorrows, or we hear of despondency within our community or our greater community, that there too we feel the heartache and the pain. It's empathy. And it is a rich gift from God that we share with one another. We need others to come alongside of us, to empathize with us, to rejoice with us, to remind us that God is good and that God is there. To have others hold our hands, to have people blow out the candles with us. As God's people, we both give and receive the assurance that Christ is with us. And sometimes we can best acknowledge it by just sitting beside each other silently. Other times it's about holding one another's hands and saying, hey, come and see what I can see. To bring all that we feel, all that we are experiencing is the vulnerability to allow ourselves to sit, to not just put on a smiley face, to not just throw out a sticker of a bear hug, but to reach out with a hand, with a phone call, with a note, and remind one another, our Lord too is there with you. This is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this is the grace that we share with one another. Amen. Tender, loving Jesus, we are so grateful for your presence with us each and every day. In days gone by and in days present, we are so grateful to know that we are not alone, that you are with us. And Father, perhaps there are things in our past or even in our present where we just don't feel you, where we're not sure, where perhaps we feel abandoned or lost or forgotten. And then, Father, we take comfort that no one was more abandoned than you on the night on which you were betrayed. And we're reminded once again that you walked that journey for our sake, and we're so grateful. Fill us now with the assurance of your Holy Spirit that you are with us, and you know. You know us so deeply. And we're so grateful. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that in all of that, you call us to be your followers, your children, your brothers and sisters, your friend. We thank you that you call us to a life of holier living, that we would be a people who obey the commands and desires of our Father in heaven. 
that we may be your witnesses to a world that doesn't know where to place their joys, that doesn't always know where to place their sorrows. And we pray, Father, that you would use us, your people, to reach out with that kind of love, that we may celebrate other people, that we may speak for their justice and their freedom, that we may extend to them love and grace, and that we may also witness to them of the wonderful, freeing salvation of our Lord and Savior. What a privilege it is, Jesus, that we have been called. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless our, our efforts as we pray for Beirut, as we give of our gifts to Beirut. And Lord, as, as we also reach out to our neighborhood in different ways, we thank you for our church as a denomination that reaches out with a cup of cold water in so many ways. We pray, Jesus, that it may be a blessing to those who need food, shelter, clothing, and your redemptive saving word. Father, we want to pray this morning for Mary's sister Jane. We're not sure where things are at right now as she's been taken to hospital. And Father, we pray that your hand would be upon her, that she may know that you are near. And Jesus, that you would place your hand upon her and that you would bring healing to her. We pray for her family as well. Father, we think of the tragic accident on the, just down the road with the motorcycles and, Lord, the loss of life and the injuries. And for those who witnessed it, Father, we pray that you would be very near to them, that they may know your presence there as well, that they may know that you are near them and that you walk beside each and every one of us in life and in death. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have of gathering to worship. No matter where we are, you unite us as one in your name. And it is such a privilege as we continue to be the church worldwide, but also the church right here in our community. What a privilege it is to be able to call each other brothers and sisters. Father, as we go out from this place, we pray your blessing and your grace upon each person, upon each family, upon our community, and upon our world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you receive the benediction. Go out now. Praising God, our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all compassion and all comfort. Know that it is your God who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we might comfort those in need. Do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.